You probably know me well enough by now to know that, for me, there are two sports in the world, hockey and not hockey. That being said, as a Gen Xer, it was hard not to be mesmerized by the aerial acrobatics of Michael Jordan, the human highlight reel, in his prime. Watching him dunk, you thought that the man defied gravity. For any great jumper, a key part of the jump stems from the thrust generated in the posterior compartment of the leg, which is the topic of today's lesson. Good day, and welcome to this installment of the video podcast series. In today's session, we make our way into the leg. This may cause some confusion at first. I mean, haven't we been spending the past few sessions discussing the leg after all? In anatomy, the leg only refers to the region found between the knee and the ankle joints. The region between the knee and the hip is referred to as the thigh. Once again, a rather short session today, so it might be a good chance for you to do a few KLE exercises, or possibly review for the upcoming exam. We'll start with a brief discussion of the different compartments of the leg. Continue with... Good day, and welcome to this installment of the video podcast series. In today's session, we make our way... Good day, and welcome to this installment of the video podcast series. In today's session, we make our way into the leg. This may cause some confusion at first. I mean, haven't we been spending the past few sessions discussing the leg after all? In anatomy, the leg only refers to the region found between the knee and the ankle joints. The region between the knee and the hip is referred to as the thigh. Once again, a rather short session today, so it might be a good chance for you to do a few KLE exercises, or possibly review for the upcoming exam. We'll start with a brief discussion of the different compartments of the leg, continue with a review of the osteology of the tibia and fibula, which make up the leg, and then get into the specific contents of the posterior compartment, namely the muscles, the vessels, and the nerves. As with the thigh, the leg can be divided into three separate compartments. In the next session, we'll be talking about the anterior and lateral compartments. The anterior compartment contains the muscles responsible for dorsiflexion and toe extension and can also assist in flu inversion. It is supplied by the anterior tibial artery and innervated by the deep fibular nerve. The lateral compartment contains the muscles responsible for ankle eversion, which also assist in plantar flexion. It receives its blood supply from the fibular artery and is innervated by the superficial fibular nerve. Today, our focus is on the posterior compartment. As we will see, this can be subdivided into a superficial and deep posterior compartment, separated by a neurovascular plane. The muscles of the superficial compartment are the principal plantar flexors of the body, while the deep compartment muscles flex the toes and assist in ankle inversion. Both subcompartments receive their blood supply from the posterior tibial and fibular arteries and are all innervated by the tibial nerve. We've already discussed the anatomy of the proximal tibia and fibula. This includes the tibial tuberosity and anterolateral tibial tubercle, also known as Gerdes tubercle, for attachment of the quadriceps femoris and iliotibial band, respectively. We previously observed the articulation at the knee with the medial and lateral tibial condyles and the intercondylar eminence that lies between. The proximal tibiofibular joint between the head of the fibula and the fibular articular facet is a planar type synovial joint. Distally, the tibia ends in a flat horizontal articular surface with a medial projection of bone, the medial malleolus. The lateral surface contributes to the joint articulation at the ankle, increasing the surface area contact and stabilizing the joint. On the lateral side, the lateral malleolus of the fibula also projects past the horizontal ridge of the tibia, completing the lateral articulation at the ankle joint. The distal tibiofibular joint is an example of a syndesmosis, or slightly movable fibrous joint, rather than a synovial type joint. It is reinforced by the interosseous membrane and anterior and posterior ligaments along the distal surfaces of the tibia and the fibula. We'll also take time to briefly look at some of the bones of the feet and their articulations, starting with the bones that make up the tarsus. The most superior bone in this group is the talus. Although it has no direct tendinous attachments, it has numerous articular projections. 
The body is wedge-shaped and aligned with articular cartilage on its superior, medial, and lateral surfaces to form the ankle joint, as well as inferiorly for articulation with the calcaneus. The head projects anterior and inframedially to articulate with the navicular bone. The head can be easily palpated medially through the skin, especially when the foot is everted. The calcaneus is the largest of the tarsal bones, accepting the weight of the talus and everything above it, and transferring it anteriorly into the metatarsals and posteriorly into the ground through the pronounced calcaneal tuberosity. The anterosuperior surface is lined with hyaline cartilage and articulates with the inferior surface of the talus. This includes a medial projection of bone known as the sustentaculum tali. The projection resembles a shelf, preventing the medial collapse of the talus into a region containing a number of tendons and neurovascular structures. The anterior surface articulates with the cuboid bone. The posterior compartment of the leg is the region that lies posterior to the tibia, fibula, and interweaving interosseous membrane, and is responsible for plantar flexion and inversion of the ankle. As previously stated, the region is subdivided into the superficial and deep compartments. This is more than just an arbitrary division. The transverse intermuscular septum represents a thickening of the intermuscular fascia that creates something of a physical separation between the two groups of muscles. In addition, we see two separate neurovascular compartments. The posterior tibial bundle, containing the main branch of the tibial nerve, and the posterior tibial artery and vein, and the fibular bundle, containing the fibular artery and vein. Muscles of the posterior compartment include gastrocnemius, soleus, and plantaris in the superficial compartment, and tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, and flexor hallucis longus in the deep compartment. Before we start with the superficial and deep compartments, we need to discuss a deep muscle that is a bit of an outlier, literally and figuratively. The popliteus sits outside the true deep compartment and acts on the knee rather than on the ankle. It originates off the lateral epicondyle of the femur, running inframedially to insert on the posterior lateral surface of the proximal tibia. In the previous class, we discussed the screwing home mechanism of lateral rotation of the tibia on the femur. In order to initiate knee flexion, the knee must first unlock through medial rotation of the tibia. This, then, is the principal role of the popliteus. Instances of popliteal tendonitis can result in pain over the lateral surface of the femur during unlocking and a reluctance of the patient to fully extend the knee. We'll take a look at the superficial compartment first. All three muscles insert on the calcaneus through the calcaneal, or more commonly, Achilles tendon. Because of this arrangement, they are sometimes referred to as the triceps serrae muscle. This powerful muscle group is responsible for more than 90% of the force in powerful plantar flexion. They receive their innervation from the tibial nerve and their vascular supply through the posterior tibial artery. Superficially, we find gastrocnemius. Its prominent muscle bellies and distinct myotendinous junction make it easy to identify superficially, in particular when plantar flexed. This bulge appearance accounts for its name. Gastrocnemius means the stomach of the leg in Latin. The muscle has distinct medial and lateral heads, originating posteriorly superior to the articular surfaces of the medial and lateral femoral condyles, respectively. It generates the superficial portion of the calcaneal tendon. Its primary role is in a, as a powerful plantar flexor of the ankle. As it is a two-joint muscle, however, it can also have an effect on knee flexion in particular when the ankle is dorsiflexed to take up slack in the tendon. Deep to gastrocnemius is the soleus, the Latin term for sandal, which describes its shape. It has a rather broad origin off the posterior surface of the fibula that arches over towards the tibia. It bridges over the interosseous space as the soleal arch, which allows for passage of the neurovascular bundle into the space between the superficial and deep compartments. Distally, it fuses early on with gastrocnemius to form the Achilles tendon. It also contracts to produce plantar flexion, but as it doesn't cross the knee, it has no effect on this joint. While gastrocnemius is almost exclusively activated for forceful contractions, soleus is also active in normal standing to maintain balance and walking for propulsion. It is therefore the workhorse of the compartment. One final, somewhat odd muscle is left to discuss. 
this is the plantaris, a small rounded muscle that originates from just superior and medial to the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. What makes it unique is its long slender tendon that runs inframedially between the gastrocnemius and soleus to insert on the Achilles tendon. Its appearance has resulted in the nickname first year nerve due to the tendency for inexperienced anatomy students to mistake this tendon for a nerve. Because of its small size and the high density of muscle spindles, it's thought to play more of a role in proprioceptive stretch reflex than in force generation. This brings us to the deep compartment. In contrast to the superficial compartment, which can expand into the looser fitting curl fascia, the deep compartment is encased by a tight, fibrous, transverse intermuscular septum posteriorly and an interosseous membrane anteriorly. As there is little room for expansion, swelling can result in posterior compartment syndrome, restricting blood flow to the plantar surface of the foot. We discuss three muscles here, which contribute to plantar flexion and inversion at the ankle. Entering the true posterior compartment, we start with the tibialis posterior. Tibialis posterior lies centrally in the compartment. It originates off the interosseous membrane and adjacent portions of the posterior surface of the tibia and fibula. The tendon runs medially to pass posterior to the medial malleolus, deep to the flexor retinaculum, and has a rather extensive insertion on the navicular, cuneiform, and first four metatarsal bones. This muscle is comparable to the flexor carpi muscles in the forearm and is exclusively involved with plantar flexion and inversion. Medial to tibialis posterior is flexor digitorum longus. It originates off the posterior surface of the medial tibial shaft and once again passes under the flexor retinaculum of the ankle to insert on digits two through four in the foot. In many respects, its structure and function is similar to the flexor digitorum profundus that we saw in the forearm. In addition to plantar flexion and inversion, it contributes to flexion of digits two through five in the foot. The final muscle to identify is the flexor hallucis longus, the lateral most of the posterior compartment. The muscle originates off the posterior surface of the fibula, passing deep in the space behind the flexor retinaculum to insert on the distal hallux or great toe. It is comparable to the flexor pollicis longus in the forearm and contributes to flexion of the great toe in addition to plantar flexion and inversion. Another role played by the flexor hallucis longus stems from its root of the tendon, passing inferior to the sustentaculum tali of the calcaneus. When the muscle contracts, the sustentaculum tali acts as a pulley, directing the line of pull superiorly from behind it. This provides a lift to the sustentaculum tali and consequently the lower limb, providing thrust during the toe-off phase of walking or running. The popliteal artery, identified previously in our study of the popliteal fossa, supplies blood to the entire leg. It passes between the medial and lateral heads of the gastrocnemius muscle to enter the posterior compartment. Here, it gives off a series of muscular branches that supply the muscles in the superficial portion of the posterior compartment. Again, this would be the gastrocnemius, soleus, and the plantaris. The artery then continues to course through the soleal arch to enter the deep portion of the posterior compartment. It almost immediately splits into anterior and posterior divisions. The anterior division is called the anterior tibial artery. We see just a small portion of this artery over here in the image on the left hand side. This artery passes between the tibia and the fibula above the superior border of the interosseous membrane to supply the anterior compartment. We'll continue to look at this vessel in the next lesson. The posterior division is the posterior tibial artery, which almost immediately gives off the fibular artery, and the two branches diverge. The posterior tibial travels between flexor digitorum longus and tibialis posterior, while the fibular artery travels between the tibialis posterior and flexor hallucis longus. Each branches extensively to supply both superficial and deep compartments. The fibular artery also gives off perforating branches to supply the lateral compartment that will be discussed in the next lesson. While the fibular artery terminates with anastomosis around the lateral malleolus of the ankle, the posterior tibial artery continues deep to the flexor retinaculum and into the plantar surface of the foot. We'll pick up the course of this vessel on our discussion of the plantar surface of the foot. 
Also note the presence of the posterior tibial, fibular, and popliteal veins, which course bilaterally with the arteries as venae comitantes. Recall that the small saphenous vein drains into the popliteal vein in the popliteal fossa. The tibial nerve travels with the posterior tibial artery, providing motor branches to all muscles in the posterior compartment. Superiorly, the motor branches to the superficial group of muscle branch to supply the gastrocnemius, soleus, and plantaris. After passing under the soleal arch, the tibial nerve gives off branches to the deep group of muscles, tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, and flexor hallucis longus. The tibial nerve continues into the foot and will be revisited in our final lecture of the unit. That will do it for this lesson on the posterior compartment. Up next, we make our way anteriorly to look at the anterior and lateral compartments. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.